so many wonderful papers that I think so many of us have read and have guided us in, in much of our thinking. I also want to thank and congratulate the OECD and particularly its health division and Secretary General Goria for focusing on the patient, for focusing on what matters, for focusing on us, on me, thinking of myself as a patient. Um, my diagnosis in 2007 in a small clinic in Cuernavaca, Morelos, Mexico, with invasive breast cancer was what changed me from being an economist who studied and learned about a health system to one who lived and lives a health system. And that allowed me to make a great choice in my life, which was to become more of a patient advocate but what I hope and would like to be called a patient advocate that does advocacy that is evidence-based. And one of the first things that I did in thinking about from my own diagnosis, how could we improve the responsiveness of the Mexican health system in that case to the needs of particularly young women with breast cancer, was to ask, what are the barriers? And in that case, we thought a lot about financial and non-financial barriers, but beyond paying directly for health services because women in Mexico are actually fully insured for their health care through the Seguro Popular. And so we began to think, what are those barriers? And we thought about, for young women, I was 41 at the time, I had two young children, I had the great and tremendous advantage of having my husband at my side, but many don't. And I thought, their big barrier is having to travel continually to get care, repeated chemotherapy treatments, and this is unnecessary. Where do they live their children? Where do they leave their children if they've been abandoned? How do they pay for the bus fare, which can be phenomenally expensive? So we started what I thought was an unusual innovation in a small secondary level hospital in a state called Jalisco, the Hospital Guzman. We decided we could work with the state and we could provide chemotherapy in a very controlled patient outcome driven manner in this small hospital. And we went to visit our star patient, let's call her Rosa, in our star hospital, Hospital Guzman. And we came in and to my great horror, the first thing I found was that the hospital had no idea that she was there, that she'd arrived. And second, we walked into the room and I fortunately was with my oncologist who was helping us with his team. And we realized that something was just tremendously wrong. And very quickly, it became evident that Doña Rosa didn't need the chemotherapy treatment. She didn't need the Herceptin that was there. She was in the last stages of her life. She was obese. She couldn't speak. She couldn't move. And the first thing her daughter did was to thank me for arranging for a program where she didn't have to travel to Guadalajara and pay several thousand pesos for the transport and try to move her mother, who was in this condition. Now, at this point, we all had to face trying to tell this 18-year-old girl that, in fact, what her mother needed was palliative care. In come the doctors, and they say, palliative care, we don't, we don't do that here. We'll move her, you move her, to Guadalajara, which is when the tears came about moving her, still not understanding what her mother's situation actually was. And I said, why? Why would you move her? She actually was not in pain, in fact, didn't need morphine. She needed some good home-based care and support for herself and her daughter. And there was no way that they could even consider providing this basic intervention that was so required. So to my shock, having seen this as a patient, myself, and having to face it, we started looking at what was the Mexican health system covering in terms of pain control and palliative care. And we were tremendously surprised to find out that the answer was very little. It was not covered in the package. It wasn't part of universal health coverage. It wasn't part of the causas of the Seguro Popular. And I admit that the year before, we had published, along with several ministers and former ministers, a paper demonstrating that Mexico had achieved universal health coverage in a program that I believe in with all my heart and soul. But somehow, this had been missed entirely from the radar screen. Now, Mexico is not the exception. It is very unfortunately the norm. And we looked globally. How, how is this missed? Well, the statistics are appalling. 
it turns out that 97% of the morphine in the world is consumed by 15% of the population. And the vast, vast majority of the world have virtually no access to pain control or palliative care. And more so, the surprising thing here, money is not the barrier. This is one of those few interventions in health where it's not because it's more expensive. This, for me, is the quintessential example, pain control and palliative care, of something which is highly, highly valued by patients and families, but not valued by health systems, and we just don't measure it. Now, ask yourself the following question. How much would you be willing to pay to have your child's tooth extracted with or without anesthesia? How much would you be willing to pay to make sure that your daughter, wife, or mother woke up from mastectomy with appropriate pain relief so that she could breathe with ease? And believe me, I've been there. That's the kind of pain you never want to feel where you don't have that pump that you can press. Right? And that, that is the norm. Again, that is the norm throughout the world. Well, most families, most people, would be willing to suffer economic catastrophe and do in trying to make sure there's access to something so, so basic and so quality attached as pain control and palliative care. We started a Lancet Commission. We're hopefully going to be submitting in a few months. And we've tried to measure, to the best we can, in really just a first stage approximation in terms of patients and patient days, what is the burden of severe health-related suffering? It turns out to be pretty big. But there are some other important results or pieces of thought that I think are relevant to what we are looking at today and what the OECD will be looking at and the ministers will be looking at. And one of them is about the importance of measuring the full value of interventions with a people-centered approach. This kind of calculus totally changes our analysis of cost-benefit because the benefits are spread so much more broadly. It's very akin to a diagonal approach, which is an idea that was pioneered by two Mexicans, Julio Frank and Jaime Sepulveda. And what it asks is, if you can take an intervention that drives change throughout a health system, and perhaps throughout the, health, the social sectors as well, what are all the benefits and how can we take account of that? If you think about pain control, topic we're looking at in this example, pain control for one disease strengthens the surgical platform throughout the system. Appropriate palliative care and pain control can have a very important responsiveness to gender equity issues because it's usually young women who do all that caregiving. Appropriate palliative care at the end of life can reduce the challenges of bereavement and complicated grief that often have all sorts of long-term effects on patients and, their, and the families that have to care for them. So then finally, what is sort of the big question that I wanted to share with you, which is at the base, why can't we do a better job at valuing something so fundamental to patients as giving them the security of dignity at end of life or the security of not having to fear treatment. It's at the center of what Avadis Donavidian for decades has had written about when he was still alive at the Center of Interpersonal Quality. And it's the core of what Secretary General Gurria, I think, was talking about when he said, we have a trust agenda. And yet for me, life expectancy doesn't do it. You don't necessarily live longer. You don't necessarily become more productive. It is just simply a value in and of itself. And I think as a world, when we think about something as fundamental as issues of patient-centeredness and quality, when we're talking about something like pain control, we have to ask our health systems, how is it possible that they're denying to the poor what the rich so much take for granted that in a sense we think about it as valueless? Thank you, and uh, if, uh, please. <laughs> Perhaps in just uh, a couple of uh, sentences, because I do want to uh, follow up on what you said. I mean, you, you posed the very obvious question, which also Michael Porter raised. If alleviation of pain is such a great value of patients, uh, why is it so often a low health care priority? So, not to be redundant but we aren't measuring it because we don't measure it through reduced mortality or increased productivity. So I think that 
is one of the most central pieces. It doesn't turn up on the top 200 priority list when your health minister is thinking about what has to be covered in their essential package. But I think there are a couple of other reasons. One is that we're all frankly afraid of this desperately afraid of it, and so we avoid thinking about it. This is a topic people's eyes cloud over, but if you thought about denying it to those who have it, that would be a different story. The next is because we have a real advocacy problem. Um, first of all, many of the people who need to advocate for this don't live very long. But second, those of us who should be advocating for something so basic in quality don't because we are the rah-rah survivors and also, frankly, you know, don't want to get there and, and don't want to think about it. Um, but the one other point I wanted to make is what it means to deny evidence to patients. When I used to speak a lot about breast cancer in settings where there was a lot of need, someone would always raise their hand and say, it's unethical for you to tell a woman she has breast cancer if you can't treat it. The only thing that that means is that she dies without knowing, and she has no voice to insist on getting resources. I think there was some discussion in the morning about why patients deserve to have that information and what they'll do with that information. And the answer is that even if we die from it, we will advocate for our rights to decent health care. And that's what we're supposed to do if we have the right measures.